Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word. I pray that you will speak to us clearly. Lord, I pray that we would have ears to hear. You've been working in our hearts this week to get us to this moment right here, right now. And so I pray that your word will fall on fertile soil and that what we learn today, God, that we would be quick to apply it to our lives right where we are right now. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So this past Friday, I had the privilege, the opportunity to go up to Washington, D.C. in the snow and the cold and march for life. And there were over 100,000 people there on the National Mall. Most of them were young people, which is a beautiful sight to see. And there's a reason that a lot of young people take a stand for life. Because if you were born after 1973, like many of us in here, like I was born after 1973, we survived the greatest genocide that our country has ever known. From 1973 to 2002, 63.5 million children were murdered in the womb. And so we got to take a stand and a march and stand up to say we love preborn lives. We love life that's been born already, but we love preborn lives as well. Now, today's message is on the right to life. And I know you may have heard sermons on abortion before, and you might think right away that, oh, this guy's going to preach it all the women in here. Please don't think that way, because we're going to look at what the Word of God says. We need to have a biblical worldview on what the Word of God says on every subject. And the Word of God speaks directly to this subject. And I know some people are afraid of this subject because they say it's political. Oh, we don't want to get political. Heard the best definition a few years ago of what politics is. You want to hear what it is? Poly, in the Greek language, means many, and a tick is a blood-sucking insect. <laughs> Sometimes it feels that way. Sometimes it feels that way, but even politicians are created in the image of God. They're image bearers, and we are to love them the way that we love everyone, respect them the way that we respect everybody. But really, politics is a battle of worldviews in the public square, and Christianity is a worldview, and I believe Christianity is the best worldview, and because I believe that, Christianity needs a place at the table in the battle of worldviews in the public square. And the church is made up of believers, of people. And so as people, when we have a biblical worldview, we need to live by that biblical worldview and share that biblical worldview with others. In every circumstance, every opportunity, the Lord opens up a door. We have an opportunity to share. I want to talk to you today from three foundational documents of our country that help form this great country that we all benefit from today. I don't know if you've ever been outside of the United States of America or not, but I have. I don't know if you've ever lived outside of the United States of America or not, but I have. And if you have, you know how great we have it here. When you were born as an American citizen here in the United States, you won the lottery. You hit the jackpot. My wife was not born in the United States, but she got here as fast as she could. And she's a citizen of this country. She's a citizen of this country today because of the foundation that we have that was laid by these foundational documents, by our forefathers, by our founding fathers. So I want to read, from, read to you today from the United States Declaration of Independence, adopted July 4th, 1776. The second paragraph reads this way. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal created by God. He created us to be equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Government did not give us these rights. God did. Amen. Somebody amen that, please. Amen. Our founding fathers recognized that, that those rights come from God himself. 
And it's the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, you can't pursue happiness if you don't have liberty, if you don't have freedom. That's why freedom is so important. But freedom doesn't matter if you don't have life. So these are interconnected. God has given us life, and with that life, we have freedom to pursue happiness. Now, according to his word, he tells us what he wants us to pursue uh, as followers of Jesus Christ with a biblical worldview. But our founding fathers understood that. Our founding document, one of our founding documents, states that. Another one I'd like to read to you. It's from the United States Constitution, the 14th Amendment, section 1, in the second sentence. And it reads this way. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So those are two of our founding documents, and they both tell us that we have the right to life. Now, there's a big debate and a big question that says, hey, where does life begin? Okay, you have the right to life, but where does it begin? That's why I want to turn to this third document that is foundational for our country. It's the Holy Bible the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. So as I, as I read from Psalm 139 earlier, hopefully you got your finger still there. You can open it back up. Starting in verse 13, going down to verse 16, God is going to define where life begins and when life begins. And that's important because he's the author of life. He's the one who gives life. So he has the right to define when it begins. And let's take a look in God's Word and see what this third foundational document for our country teaches us about the right to life. Psalm 139, starting in verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. God was involved. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. God was there in your mother's womb just like he was in my mother's womb knitting you together, weaving you together the same way that he did with me. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't know what other people have said about you and your life and who you are as a person, but your creator says this about you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made, and you can believe him on that. He gave you life, he created you, and he says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's the opinion that matters most anyway. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you. In your mother's womb, you were hidden from everybody else, but you were not hidden from God. He saw you there. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth, verse 16, and this is crucial and critical, your eyes have seen my unformed Substance. That word right there, actually two words translated into English, unformed substance, in the ancient Hebrew language is literally embryo or fetus. So God, the author of life, he determines when life begins and where it begins. And he says when that male sperm meets with that female egg in the womb at that moment, That's when life begins. And if we are Christians and followers of Jesus Christ, and we say we have a Christian biblical worldview, then we have to adopt the worldview that God gives us here. And he says life begins at conception. I know there are debates, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and it can go on and on and on. Those opinions, if if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, they're irrelevant because God says as soon as those two entities come together, they form. A human life. He defines life in the womb, and he says life is precious, fearfully and wonderfully made in the womb. We live in a country that has laws that says, hey, the distance between the womb and the outside world is the birth canal. And while you're there, you're not a person yet. You don't have the right to life yet. Our documents may say that. Our laws may say that. But God says differently. He says the moment that conception took place, life began. And he's the one who put those together. Unformed substance, that embryo, that fetus, once it takes place, God says it has the same value 
as the life on the outside of the womb. And think about it. One second after your conception, you have the same value as a baby that's three months old. The only difference is the stage of development. A three-year-old person has the same value as a 30-year-old adult, right? Amen? Everybody should amen that, right? But they are at different stages of development, right? A three-year-old is not developed like a 30-year-old, right? But they have the same value. Their life has the same value. So as soon as life begins in the womb, God says that life has the same value as those that are outside of the womb. We may not agree with it. We may not like it, but that's what God says. And if we're going to have a biblical worldview, that's the way we need to think. That's the way that we need to view things. And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as they were, when as yet there was not one of them. So this is a worldview issue. Life is a gift from God. He's the author of life. He's the one who gives life. We don't give ourselves life. Did you choose to whom you would uh, be born, when you would be born, and where you would be born? Did you choose any of those things? I didn't choose any of those things. God gave that to me, just like he gave that to you, just like he gives to every single human being. And so we need to value the life of the preborn child in the womb just as much as we value the life of the child that's outside of the womb. Statistics tell us kind of a sad story. I have some statistics from a, a website called abort73.com. You can look those up later on. From 1973 to 2022, 49 years, over this 49-year period, 63.5 million babies that had the same value in the womb as those outside of the womb were aborted, were murdered, were put to death. And there were surveys done about why people have abortions. And often the first thing when you say, hey, we, we want to end abortion, we want to stop this heinous crime from taking place in our country, the first thing that people will object with, you've probably heard it, what, what, what do people say? What about, what about rape? What about incest? What about if the mother's life is in danger, right? You, you've heard all of those. What about birth defects and uh, deformed? What about all of those things? That's usually the first objection. Based on the statistics, just listen carefully. The number of abortions that take place as a result of an incestuous relationship, we got kids in here, I'm not going to explain what that means, you know what it means. It's 0.01%. The woman was raped, 0.15%. The woman's life was endangered by the pregnancy, 0.15%. There was a serious fetal abnormality, 0.95%. Are you seeing a pattern here? If you add all of those up, what does that come up to? Mathematicians there, about 1.2%. So almost 99% of the abortions would disappear if abortion were just allowed in these cases. And I'm not saying that we need to allow them in these cases. I'm just saying this is why people go and do this. 74.2% of abortions are for elective reasons. Almost three quarters, almost three out of every four is a choice that people make. And what does God say about that life that's in the womb? It's just as valuable, it's just as precious as life outside of the womb. So if you have your um, bulletin here with you, if you have your bulletin here with you, go ahead and take it out on the back side. We're going to walk through God's Word quickly. Now, I'm going to talk fast, so you're going to have to listen even faster because there's a lot of information to cover, and this could be a uh, three, four, five-part series, but we're going to try to do it all in this one so that we can have a clear biblical picture and worldview about life. But take out your, your, your bulletin, look on the back, grab a pencil, nudge your, your, your partner if, or your uh, uh, neighbor, and get a pencil if you need one. And we're going to look at these six things here about human life, the right to life. And the rest of our time is going to be spent in this one document, the Holy Bible, the Word of God, this foundational document for our country.
In the first one, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, and we're going to learn about the value of human life. In Psalm 139, we've already seen that life begins at conception from God's perspective. The value of life in the womb is just as valuable as the life outside of the womb. But there's more in Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. Starting in verse 5, here's what we read in the Word of God. Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Look in verse 6. Pay attention here. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. Now, the gospel, the Word of God, means good news. And there is some great news in this word that I want to get to. But if you are familiar with the Bible, God, before delivering that good news, he always gives us the bad news first so that we can understand how good the good news is. And so I'm going to follow that same pattern this morning. I got to share some bad news with you first so that we can get to the good news and we can appreciate how great this good news is. But the first thing that God says here is the value of human life. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man's blood, by man, his blood shall be shed. And then he explains why. For in the image of God, he, God, made man. So when you attack a fellow human being, you are indirectly attacking God because that fellow human being was made in the image of God just like you were, just like I was just like all of us was. And there's only one punishment, he said. You can't pay enough money. If you murder someone, you can't pay enough money to pay for that life. Who in here would be, set an amount of money that you would take from somebody else to let that person murder you? Anybody want to give us a number? Absolutely not. Why? Because no number exists. That's how valuable human life is. That's how valuable human life is. No number exists. So God says you can't pay with money when you take someone's life. It also says that you can't spend the rest of your life locked up to pay for that life that you took. That's not enough. That's not enough. When we follow this principle or when we don't follow this principle, when we take something else besides life for the life that was taken, we punish the victim a second time. Did you know that? We punish the victim a second time. How's that? Because we, we declare, we didn't give life, but we declare that the life of the criminal is more valuable than the life of the victim. When we don't punish the criminal for taking the life of the victim, we, we victimize that person a second time. I'm glad God is not like we are. God takes the side of the victim. God always stands up for the victim. But that's what happens when we don't follow what God teaches here. I have a pastor friend of mine, dear brother in Christ, pastoring a church now in Texas. But before he became a Christian, he was far from the presence of God. He knew about God growing up, been taking a church off and on, but he was far from God. He was a boxer, a trained amateur boxer, and he was good at what he did. And he's about this tall, and he's built like a fire plug, just a bulldog. And he, got, he went to a bar one night, and he got so intoxicated that he doesn't even remember what happened. He got into a bar fight with a man, and he beat a man to death right there on the spot. So he was taken to, to, to prison, was given a, a, a prison sentence. And while he was there, he got into education. And he said, man, I'm, I'm, I don't have anything else to do. I'm going to start learning and studying. And so he got his paralegal degree while he was in prison. And then someone came to him and said, hey, look, you like to study. You got tools to study. Why don't you take that paralegal degree that you got? By the way, I asked for his permission to share this. I talked to him this week. Take that paralegal degree you got and apply it to studying the Bible. And he said, all right, I'll take you up on that. So he started doing that. And as he was studying through the Bible, using those tools that he had, guess what happened? He found the good news. He found the really good news that he could be forgiven in Jesus Christ. He surrendered his life to Jesus Christ, a changed man on the spot. Now, I met him after he got out of prison, after his life was turned around, after he began pastoring. And I was in a car with him one day. We're going down the road. And I said, hey, brother, uh, while you were in prison, after you came to know the Lord, when you got to this passage here in Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, said, 
How did you wrestle with that? What did you think about that? And he said, I didn't like it when I first read it. I was upset about it. And, and I tried to justify it by saying, you know, we're in the new covenant now. This doesn't apply to us anymore. Well, let me just give you a little bit of information. This is the Noahic covenant, the covenant that God made with Noah and all of the earth. The new covenant negated the old covenant with uh, Israel, but it did not negate the covenant with Noah. The Noahic covenant still stands today. That's why uh, God promises that he will never flood the earth. He will never destroy the earth by flood again. And he gives us a rainbow in the sky as a reminder of that. And he said, I had to come to grips with that and realize that I deserve to die because I took another man's life and I can't pay it back with anything else. And I said, were you ready to face that? He said, yes. If the judge would have called me forward and said, we are recommending the death penalty, he said, I wouldn't fight it. I I was ready to pay. Even though I'd been forgiven by God, I was ready to pay the price that, 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 that I deserved because of what I did. Now, in God's grace, God's mercy, and, and God's goodness, the, uh, not only did he not face the death penalty, um, his sentence was reduced and he got out on good behavior. And he's a pastor today. But the reason I share that story with you is when you take another human being's life, the only thing you can pay with is your own life. Remember that statistic I read? 60 3.5 million. That's a lot of lives that have not been paid for. That's a lot of lives, a lot of blood on the hands of our nation. That's the bad news, but there is good news. So the first one, the value of human life. The second one, the second one, we're going to look at some teaching in the scriptures on this same subject. So point number two, in the blank, right, direct, direct teaching. So in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, this commandment given in the Ten Commandments that you know all so well, you could probably quote them to me now, but this one specifically, it applies to abortion because God has already said that life begins at conception. Life is in the womb. And he says right here in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, you shall not, what does your Bible say? Shall not murder. And that is murder. When you take a life that's in the womb, That is murder. So to have a biblical worldview, what God teaches in his word, abortion is murder. It's murder. And if we claim something else, then we're not following a biblical worldview. We're following our own worldview. And there are thousands of worldviews out there. There are thousands of worldviews in the battle of the public square uh, of worldviews. This one needs to be there. In order for it to get there, we need to know it, We need to live by it, and we need to share it. So that's bad news. Based on what we see here, this this news is really bad. I I hope you realize the gravity of what we're seeing here in God's Word. If we stopped here and went home, we would have no hope. It would be awful. It would be terrible. But don't stop. There's more. There's absolutely more. And point number three, bless you. And point number three, Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 17, we learn that abortion is not a new phenomenon. It's actually an ancient problem. So in point number three, you write down the word problem. Abortion is an ancient problem. It's been around as long as sin has been around. But, but there's a caveat here. There, there's, there's a difference here, and I, and I want to just point that out to you. So in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 17, Verse 17 reads this way. Because he did not kill me before birth so that my mother would have been my grave and her womb ever pregnant. The womb is a place of life. It's life-giving. That's where life is. That's where life develops. And we all spent time there. We're at a different stage of development now, but we all spent time there. And we're here, and praise God, and we thank God for that. But here, the prophet says that when we extinguish life in the womb, we turn our mother's womb not into a place of life. What do we turn it into? What does he say? A grave. What goes in the grave? Death, decay. That, that's not, does anybody uh, ever been to a funeral where you, uh, 
uh, you finished and said amen, and then everybody just stayed and, and lived right there in the graveyard? No, what do you do? You leave. You go home. You leave it there. Why? Nobody wants to be around death. Nobody wants to be around that. This is what the prophet says. That mother's womb that's supposed to be a place of life, life-giving, is turned into a grave, a place of death. And this is an ancient problem. The Canaanites were practicing this all the way back when Israel came into the promised land. The Israelites practiced it once they came into the promised land. The Greeks practiced it in human history. And the Romans practiced it in human history. But you know what the difference was between the way they did it and the way we do it today? Back then, it was infanticide. They would allow the baby to be born. They didn't want to turn the mother's womb into a tomb into a grave, into a place of death. They would allow the baby to be born, and then they would put that child to death. And we think, man, that is barbaric. And it is barbaric. But is abortion not worse? Because now we've turned the mother's womb into a place of death. This hits hard. This hits very hard. But we need to hear this. We need to wrestle with this. We need to face this so that we can see the good news. And the good news becomes so much better once you understand this and once you face this. All right, the next one, number four. So, so far, we've seen the value of human life, a direct teaching against abortion. We've seen that abortion is an ancient problem that's been around as long as sin has been around as long as our sin nature has been around. Number four, we're going to look at an indirect teaching. The word abortion is not used in this passage, but it's described. It's described, and we'll look at it. So this is an indirect teaching. So if you're in Exodus 20, which is interesting, this is one chapter later. In Exodus 20, we get the Ten Commandments, and he says, do not murder, very clearly. Then in Exodus 21, one chapter over, he gives us a scenario that we get to look at. And let's take a look at it. Verse 22. If men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child. What does that mean? Where is that baby? If that woman is with child, where is that baby? We we use this expression today, right? She's with child. What does that mean? She's not carrying it in her arms, pushing it in the stroller. Where is that baby? It's in her womb. It's in her womb. So right here, if, two men, if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. Did you notice who all is involved with this? Let me point that out to you. First of all, society is involved with this. Society is supposed to protect pregnant women. Did you notice that? These two men, they represent society. They're fighting with each other. Unintentionally, they strike her. They weren't careful around her. They didn't protect her. And as a result, that happened. What what does our society say today? What does our society demand today for pregnant women? They need to have the right to do what? To choose. That's right. But God says, no, 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 society. And notice, notice in, all, in, the, in, this, in this scenario, he doesn't talk to the women. He doesn't talk to the woman. Who does he address? Let me read it one more time. If men struggle, and then the woman's husband is to go to the judges. So who does God talk to? Who's supposed to protect uh, women and children, pregnant women? Men, men. God created us as men to be powerful. Did you notice that? Now, some of us, we kind of let ourselves go over the years, but God created us to be powerful. And all it takes is a little work and those muscles pop up. You can take a girl of the same size as a guy. They both start working out. They both eat the same diet. And what's going to happen to that guy? He's going to be more powerful. He's going to be more, he's going to be stronger. Why? Because that's the way God made us as men. We are powerful. But why did God make us powerful? He gave us the responsibility to protect, to be protected. And specifically to protect whom? Women and children, and especially the most vulnerable humans on this planet. Who are the most vulnerable humans on this planet? Babies in the womb. Babies in the womb. They have no one to speak for them. They can't speak for themselves. They are the most vulnerable. Men have been given power to protect. And what did these two guys do? They didn't do it on purpose. It was just accidental. We do it on purpose today. 
We send women to abortion clinics. We tell them. I spoke with one of our workers at CareNet, who's a member of our church, and uh, I just wanted to get a feel for what it's like to counsel people who are post-abortion. Because unfortunately, that happens. Clients come into CareNet, and the, the volunteers there work with them and pray for them and share with them their resources for them. And we try everything possible to save that life in the womb. But it doesn't always happen. And then there is a follow-up. And in, in, in the post-abortion follow-up, uh, they sit down and they counsel with these women. And do you know what? The main reason that these women say, it's not, it, it's not all of them, but in the majority of the cases, the women say this, if I would have had somebody to stand with me, I would not have gone through that. But the men in my life, whether it be a boyfriend or a husband or a father, they encouraged me to do that. They would not stand with me to bring this baby to full term. And as a result, they felt like they had no one and they did it. Men, what does it say right here? Men, men, men. If we would do what God has called us to do, we wouldn't have to have marches to end abortion. It would end almost overnight if the men of this country would step up and do what we're supposed to do and teach the teenage boys of this country to live as men and teach the, 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 the male children how to become men, this would go away. But these two men didn't protect. They had power, but they didn't protect. But did you notice the husband? He stepped up. He stepped up and said, yeah, this needs to be done. And if they, he can't get it done between those two guys, then they take it to the judge. So you got society involved, you've got the husband involved, and the laws of the land, the judges there were there to protect whom? Men and women who had already been born, but those laws were there in Israel also to protect male and female preborn children. God gave them the same value here in this passage. The same value. Their life has the same value. Those inside the womb as those outside of the womb. And here's what he says. The judges will decide. So if she just gives birth prematurely and there's no other injury to her or the child, then there is a fine that these men have to pay. But, look in the next one. Verse 23. But... If there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty, what, is, what does your Bible say? Life for a life. Genesis 9 said what? What did God teach us in Genesis 9? What is the value of human life? What can you give to pay for a human life that you take? There's no amount of money. There's no bribery going on. There's only one thing you can do. You can pay with your life. And now people read the Old Testament and they say, oh man, death everywhere. They, people must have been just dying in the streets because it's, it's life for a life. No, 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 no. People feared. They feared the consequences of their actions. And so they valued life. They protected life so that they wouldn't face the consequences of those actions. Today, we have no fear. We have no fear of God. We have no fear of, of the people around us. And that's not a good place to be in. We look around and we say, man, our society is falling apart. Why do you think it's falling apart? What's happened over the last 49 years and continues to happen, even though the law was overturned, Roe versus Wade was overturned, it's still happening. It's still happening. If men would stand up and do what we're called to do to protect women and children, we wouldn't even be having this discussion anymore. It would transform things just like that. There's a Bible study that my wife and I teach, and I'm not going to use the word because it's mixed company here and they're children, but I'll use the word physical intimacy. It's called the truth about physical intimacy, and it teaches physical intimacy from a biblical perspective, what God says about this relationship. And there's a reason we teach this, because we teach it to teens, especially teen boys, about the importance of maintaining their purity, not practicing immorality. That's another reason that a large portion of abortions take place in our country every year is because of immorality. It, because people are not waiting until they get married to enjoy this physical intimacy, a gift that God gave to us. They're opening that gift before it's time 
And there are consequences that come. And that's one of the consequences. Now, this benefits men greatly because men think, hey, we can do what we want. We can sow our wild oats. We can have this physical intimacy. And there are no consequences. There are no repercussions. Because if she does end up getting pregnant, there's always an abortion. No problem. Who's, who's the victim in this? Who ends up being the victim in this? Obviously the children, but who else? The women. Yes, yes, yes. That's why God looks at the men of society when he teaches on this. It says, hey, men, do your job and step up. Huh, women aren't getting pregnant by themselves. You know that, right? There's another person involved. And so we teach this, this, this Bible study called The Truth About Physical Intimacy, and people learn why God tells us to wait why God says this is a gift, it's a phenomenal gift, but it has to be in the confines of marriage. And if you take it out and you open it before being in the confines of marriage, there are consequences, grave consequences that come as a result of that. And I like to teach it to the boys because I'm a man and I'm trying to teach boys and teenage boys how to become men. My wife likes to teach it to the girls because she's female and she's trying to teach girls and teenage girls how to become women with a biblical worldview. I highly recommend this study. There are two versions of it. There's one that's only six lessons. It's like the Cliff's Notes version. And then there's one that's about 16 or 18 lessons. Fantastic study. If you want your teens to study it, come and, and, and talk to me. I would love to help them uh, learn that study because it's so vital. So vital. Another thing that shows that we care about children, not just the pre-born children, but also the children who, are, who have been born, if you've worked in children's ministry or any other ministries that involve minors, you've probably already received our new child safety policy. And it's called the new child safety policy, although it's not new. It's actually an old policy that was on the books that was not, uh, not actually, uh, uh, I can't think of the word, being implied, not, not implied, enforced, enforced, that's the word, not being enforced. And so for whatever reason, I don't know, not throwing any stones, but uh, our, our team has come together. We've uh, found it. We've beefed it up. We've gotten it ready. And now we're going to start enforcing it here at the church. Why? Because we care about children. We want them to be protected. We want them to be safe when they come to this place and when they work around adults, when adults work with them, both men uh, and women. So take that seriously. If you receive that new child safety policy, read through it, do the, watch the videos that go along with it. And, and, and do what it says, because it's for your protection. It's also for the protection of the children here in the church. Because as I said, a lot of times we're accused as evangelical Christians of loving kids in the womb, but we don't care about them once they've been born. That's absolutely not true. We love all kids, pre-born and born. And that's one of the ways that we show that is by making sure that they are safe and they are secure when they come to this place to learn how to have a biblical worldview. I mentioned CareNet already. Our CareNet ministry is occupied day and night with the preborn, and not just the children, but the mothers as well, and the fathers, so that they can learn the value of human life. There, is, there are courses that teach them how to parent. There are resources available for them, diapers and formula, all of those things. So we want that child not just to be born, but we want that child to prosper after he is born, after she is born. Our homeschool co-op here, we teach Christian education so that we can teach kids to have a Christian worldview. Our Awana program that meets on Wednesday nights, every single Wednesday night, kids are memorizing Bible verses, studying the Bible, learning how to have a Christian worldview so that they can change, transform our society moving forward. Timothy School, as I mentioned already, it is a missionary training school for teenagers. It trains them, trains them how to be missionaries to their peers, to their peers. So if you've got a kid that goes to a public school and your kid goes to a Timothy school, that kid's going to be trained to be a missionary to that public school or private school or home school or the neighborhood kids or the ball teams that they play on. Wherever they go, whatever they do, they're being sent out as little rockets, little missiles, little arrows right into the middle of that crowd as missionaries to, to proclaim the message of the gospel. If you want your team to get involved with Timothy School, let me know. Let me know. They have a great time. It meets twice a year, and they have practical assignments when they come home, and they invest in their peers. They start Bible study groups. They grow tremendously. They proclaim the gospel, and they are the missionaries to their peers. They're the best missionaries for their peers. 
So this is the indirect teaching from Exodus chapter 21. Now, I'm going to shift gears and we're going to get into the good news now. And it's important that we get to the good news, but we needed to see how bad it is so that the good news really is great and we understand how great it is. So point number five, point number four was an indirect teaching, Exodus 21, 22 through 25. Point number five, there's one blank there. Write down the word forgiveness. Forgiveness. We need hope. We see how grave the situation is in in our country and what we've been through over the last 49 years and continuing to go through. But there is hope. There's hope. There's hope. If you didn't know the value of human life in the womb, if you were lied to and deceived and you thought it was just a clump of cells and you went through with that, there's hope for you. There's, there absolutely is hope for you. First John chapter one, verses eight and nine. This is not the gospel of John. This is John's epistle, his letter that he writes in first John chapter one, verses eight and nine. Here's what he says. Here's what he writes. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. You hear that? So if you say abortion is not a sin, it's not a crime, it's just a clump of cells, what does the Bible say right here? It says you are deceiving yourself. You may have a worldview, but it's not a Christian worldview. It's not a biblical worldview. Because the biblical worldview says that life begins at conception in the womb, according to God's word. He tells us very clearly that. So if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We're sinners. We know that. Let me ask you a question. Very simple question. Your littlest child can answer this one. What do sinners do? They sin, that's right, that's right. So it says, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So this is for all of us. What we're about to read is for absolutely every one of us because we're sinners. Verse nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you catch what the hope is here? God promises to forgive us. He will forgive us, not based on what we deserve, not based on who we are. He says, based on his character and who he is, he's able to forgive us. He's faithful. He is righteous. We're not. So he's able to forgive us based on who he is. But there's a connection here. What do do we have to do? There's a role that we have to play. What does he say? Confess. That word confess is beautiful. It's important to understand it but it's beautiful. It means to agree with. So when we confess our sins, we agree with God that what he said was right and what we did was wrong. We don't try to hide it. We don't try to cover it up. We don't try to keep it a secret. A lot of times, especially in this area, when it comes to something like this, we think, oh, well, as long as I don't give up the secret, as long as I don't surrender the secret, as long as it's between me and God, nobody knows about it, everything's fine. And what does he say here? You need to confess. You need to agree with God. Agree with God that, yes, he said it's wrong, and you did it. Don't try to shift the blame. Don't try to say, it's his fault. He made me do it. Or it's her fault. She made me do it. Or it's society's fault. They tricked me. I didn't know. None of that works. None of that works. God said it's wrong. You did it. Confess means, yes, God, you said it's wrong, and I did it. I'm guilty before you, and I'm ready to face the consequences, whatever they may be. If it's judgment, I'm ready to face that. I understand that. And praise God that he gives us mercy and grace here. He forgives us. He forgives us. He forgives the eternal consequence of the sin of abortion. If you've had an abortion, God can forgive you of that eternal consequence. But do keep in mind that just because your eternal consequences have been forgiven, there still may be temporary consequences in this lifetime. A man who has relations before getting married with different women can be forgiven. If he comes to God and he confesses, Lord, you said it was wrong and I did it. I'm at your mercy. God can forgive that person. But if he caught a disease, he may have to face that disease the rest of his life. That's the consequence of it. So the eternal consequences are removed, but there there may be some temporary consequences that you have to face in this life. And they don't want to tell you that. Those that that say abortion is just clipping some cells, you'll get over it. They don't want to tell you about the dreams that you have. They don't want to tell you about the feelings of guilt. They don't want to tell you about, hey, 
This child would be five years old right now. This would have been the day that he would have been born. This is what he would look like. They don't want to tell you about those things, those psychological things that you can't take medicine for, that you can't do anything to get rid of other than being forgiven by God. And when God forgives you, you're forgiven. You don't even have to forgive yourself. I know a lot of people, I hear this. People say, I know God can forgive me, but I can't forgive myself. It doesn't matter. If God, the creator of the universe and your creator forgave you, you don't need to forgive yourself. Are you better than God? Do you have a higher position than God? Of course not. But if he forgives you, you're forgiven. Walk in that forgiveness. Live in that forgiveness. Stand on that forgiveness. I heard one amen. Thank you. Everybody should be amen in that. Absolutely everybody. There is hope. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. But it comes with confession. And here's another one that's very important. It's important to confess to God and and, and allow him to forgive you because he's the only one who can forgive you. But you also need to surrender the secret. You need to share with someone else. You need to share with a spiritual leader, a spiritual authority figure, not because we want to know your business, not because we need to know your business, but we can help you walk in that forgiveness. We can help you... um, Go through the process of really understanding that forgiveness and being restored to a place where you can serve others and you can help others and you can invest in the life of others. So it's very important that you surrender that secret. Very important that you share with somebody who's trustworthy, who's not going to condemn you, but who's going to come alongside you and say, I'm here to help you. And here's why. And that's another thing that I heard from one of the counselors at CareNet is that that is a huge burden that lifts off people's shoulders. When they they share with somebody else, this is what I've done. This is what's happened. And that person says, you know what? God has forgiven you. You're forgiven. And you can walk in that forgiveness. It's so important. But we have to confess it. Psalm 32, verses three through five, listen to what David says. You know what he did with Bathsheba? You know that he had a man murdered, and God said, you're the one who murdered. Even though David didn't uh, stab him with a sword, shoot him with an arrow, David set things up so that, that his best friend would be killed in battle. And God says, you're the murderer, David. Even though you didn't do it directly, you're the murderer. But listen to what David says in Psalm 32, verses three through five. When I kept silent about my sin, when I tried to cover it up, when I didn't want to surrender the secret, when I wanted to keep it, and I know you're terrified thinking, if I, if I let this out, people are gonna know who I really am. Newsflash, you're a sinner just like I'm a sinner. You are capable of doing awful things just like I'm capable of doing awful things because I am a sinner. I won't be shocked. None of us will be shocked. None of us, if you, if you get that out, if you let it out, none of us will be shocked. But David said, I kept silent about my sin and my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. And if you've done something that nobody else knows about but you and God, you know what this is like where it it will not leave you alone. You try to run away from it. You try to cover it up. You try to self-medicate, and it will not go away. God tells us that. And he says, all you got to do is surrender. Confess to God, be forgiven. Share with someone else so that they can help counsel you in being restored. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Verse five, I acknowledged my, that's confession right there to acknowledge what he did. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. But you do know that David didn't just confess to the Lord. Who else did he confess to? Do you know? He surrendered the secret of what he did. Nathan the prophet. Nathan the prophet came and said, you're that man. And David stood before him and he said, you're absolutely right. I am did it. God forgave him. Nathan forgave him. Nathan helped restore him. That's what this means. That's what this means. The last one, and I know I've gone over a little bit. Sorry, guys. We're not going to make it to lunch before the Methodist church, but that's okay. You can laugh at that. It's fine. Number six. Number six. Psalm 51, restoration. God doesn't want to just forgive you He also wants to restore you so that you can be in a place to help others. That's what God wants to do in your life, in my life, in all of our lives. Psalm 51, restoration, write that in number six. In verse 12, here's what he says. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. 
So David, was he was destroyed by what he did. He lost a lot in his life by what he did. His life was straight up in his relationship with God until he made that mistake. And then he was still used by God, but it was all downhill after that. But God did restore it, and God used him. And God can do the same for you, for me, for absolutely all of us. And when God does restore us, he says, I will teach transgressors your ways. My wife teaches a study called Lord Heal My Hurts. And if you've been in that study, it is powerful. It's hard because you have to look in the mirror. You have to look deep down inside of yourself and, and deal with some stuff and wrestle with some stuff. But God brings healing when you do that. He wants you. To, to look down deep inside. And, and he wants to do business with you so that he can forgive you and he can restore you. But it's not pleasant. It's not fun. It's painful, but it's necessary. It's necessary. And so if you have something like this and you want healing, full healing, forgiveness and restoration, talk to my wife, Elena. She can help you get your hands on a copy of that book and go through it. Go through it with you. But I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. In Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, I'm not going to read it for the sake of time here, but Jesus says two things about his followers. They are salt, the salt of the earth, and the light of the world. Let me ask you, what is salt used for, primarily in our culture today? Seasoning, right? Well, in antiquity, they used it for seasoning, but that wasn't the main use. The main use was to preserve food. Or in other words, it was to stop decay. That's what salt was used for primarily, to stop decay. What does sin do to a society? It causes that society to decay. So if I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and I am the salt of the earth, like he wants me to be, like he wants you to be, then everywhere I go with a biblical worldview, sharing the message of the gospel, I'm going to slow down the decay in our society that sin brings. So if our church were the salt of the earth, living as the salt of the earth, each one of us were living like that on a daily basis, had a biblical worldview, lived that biblical worldview every day, and shared that biblical worldview every day, what would happen to our society? Would it be transformed? Absolutely. Absolutely. God wants that to happen. He's told us to do it. Why is it not happening? That's where we get into the hubba 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 why is it not happening? Where does the finger go? I want to blame God. I want to blame something else. But where does it go? Me, me. If I'm the salt of the earth and living as the salt of the earth and doing my part and you're doing your part and each one of us and our families are doing our part, it will bring a transformation. The same with light. Light brings, it drives away darkness. So when you walk into a room with light, all that darkness flees. That's what I'm called to be. That's what you're called to be, to drive out the darkness that's around us with the word of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, we find that God tells us, actually, the apostle Paul tells us, God, through the apostle Paul, says that the church, believers, us together united, we are the pillar and support of truth of the word of God. So we are to stand in society with this word of God, live it and proclaim it boldly with a biblical worldview. If we don't do that, you know what society does, right? It'll remove the truth and put something else up there. And it has. It absolutely has to where people are being taught and they believe that taking human life in the womb is a choice that you have. You're just snipping a few cells. It's no different than taking out your tonsils, no different than having your appendix removed. No, no, no. That child in the womb has a separate DNA than the mother. It is a human, science even teaches us this. Science is starting to catch up with the Bible. In 1973, science was a lot different than it is today. Today, science is saying, yeah, there, there's, there's something going on there. There's a spark of life. There's a separate DNA. We see the developmental process. All of these things. So we need to stand up as a pillar and support of the truth. Have this biblical worldview. Get this biblical worldview in, in our uh, spheres of influence, every circle we find ourselves in, we need to be salt and light, salt and light, salt and light. Timothy School is training teenagers to be that way. Awana is training children and teenagers to be that way. Connect groups, training children and teenagers to be that way. Everything we're doing right now here at this place is trying to get people in the Word of God, get this Word of God, this biblical worldview in them so that they can be salt and light 
everywhere that they go. And that will transform our society. That will. As I close here, if you need to confess something to the Lord, you can do that right where you are. But if you really want, if you really want freedom, I can't forgive you. God is the only one who can forgive. But if you really want freedom and you want to surrender that secret and you want full restoration so that you can walk in that forgiveness that God gives you and be used by God to reach others, then come forward. Come and share with me. Share with somebody that you trust who can help you in this process. There are many from CareNet who are among us now who would love to be there for you, for both men and women. It's not just women. It's also men who participate in that. You may be guilty on either side. There is forgiveness. There is hope. God can restore you, and he can use you, but you have to confess it. You have to confess it to him, and you need help in that process. That's why we're here. So as the musicians come up, and we sing this last song, if you need to come forward and do business with God, please do so. And don't feel like, oh, no, if I come forward and I repent and I confess, then people are going to look at me differently. No, people are, it's beautiful to see confession take place because you get freed of a burden you were never meant to carry. And God wants that for you. I want that for you. That's why we're here today. That's why we do what we do. So don't wait on that. God's dealing with you right now. Do business with him. If you want to come and join our church, you can come forward and do the same. Let me close in a word of prayer, and then we'll sing our last song. God, I thank you for this opportunity. Lord, we know what reality is, God, and what our world is like. And there's not a lot of hope in this world. But we did see hope in your word. We did see hope in Jesus Christ. Help us cling to that hope, Lord. And if we've messed up, God, please help us to be courageous and confess to you, Lord, and to reach out for help, to surrender that secret, God, so that we can experience full forgiveness and walk in that full forgiveness and be restored so that we can be useful to you and used by you to help those around us. Help us change this society during our lifetime so that our next generations can reap the benefits of that. It's in Jesus' name I pray.